We have a wonderful feature for you this evening. Kitty Costello. Now, you take the terms poet, you take the terms inspirational, you think of good-heartedness. Those three terms, combine them like you might combine the primary colors, and you get a rich rainbow of varying kinds of expression. The person is capable. She has a voice that needs to be heard. There's the truth that comes out, then there's the truth that you hear when you say, oh, she really meant, and I thought, and the things that go through your mind as she reads, this is the thing that, that I like about poetry in particular. The person's up here reading, like Kitty will be doing, and then the stories go through your mind, the memories that you have that are brought up, and that is part of the poetry. That is part, it's not on the page, she doesn't necessarily, she doesn't intend that necessarily, but it's the rich part of the experience. It's the cream of the cream of the cream, as I like to call it. It's beautiful. And that's my favorite part, because she will take us to places, and then we also go places, and then it becomes like a symphonic arrangement of thought, mind, emotion, soul, and heart. It's beautiful. And we are about to be transported. So give her a nice round of applause as she comes up here and transports us. And we don't stop talking about sky. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, especially all those folks that I know wouldn't be here unless they... She brought, she back the house, but she did. And all the rest of you. You go, girl. So I wanted to start off with somebody else's poem. Uh, something that just came back to my attention this week, which is um, Wendell Berry's poem, Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. He's like a many generation, uh, descended from many generations of Kentucky farmers. So I'm excerpting this because it's kind of long. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay, want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die. And you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be a punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. <laughs> so friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvesting when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophecy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful though you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. As soon as the generals and politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. <laughs> Good idea. Thank you, Dan. So, um, being being at Sacred Grounds reminds me of uh, my old friend Carlos Ramirez, who was oh, a regular yeah. here. Um, there he is. There he is. So, I wanted to read a tribute that I wrote for Carlos. He used to come to our meditation group, too, for a bunch of you folks that are here from my meditation group. 
Too soon, Carlos, too soon. You could see his halo from blocks away down sun-seared mission streets, his glow arriving well before his sweet, smile-crinkled face came to full view. Beside the produce stand one day, our friendship still new, he showed me how you could wrap yourself, each arm clasping the opposite shoulder to gently knead and rock, rock and knead and self-embrace whenever feeling loveless or afraid. Eyes and ears deeply tuned, he'd ask, how's Kitty today, meaning me? And my answer, wrapped in soul listening, let me hear unforeseen selves speaking. When powers that are bellowed leaned their mean weight down, soldiers, fathers, petty cops, he shied deeply into ready refuge of his own vast tenderness. Pruning his poem tunes, teaching us how to make it rain, Pied pipering children who let flow for him their no longer silent poet voices onto once white paper. Nice. <laughs> and this is a seasonal haiku. Well, actually all haiku were supposed to be seasonal, but I, I usually just write the 17 syllables, but anyway. First rains are falling, and me with open-toed shoes, my socks go squish, squish. <laughs> this is my new uh, and really only book. She <laughs> has out copies this year, of this book. Waking. Here, Jess, I forgot to mention that. Sorry. And this comes from 40 years of uh, gathering poems that I've written all during the time I've been in San Francisco. This one's called Our Father. He never said his grandfather was a twin named Bartholomew. Never told that Bartholomew was a coal miner in West Virginia after fleeing Irish famine. No, Dad's people were all small town, small farm, grow and can your own, fish in the creek out back Ohio folk. His dad a machinist on the B&O line. Not our family, black face with soot scratching a wage in the earth's dark bowels. How did Bartholomew make that climb from black poison air, from premature burial and cold rubble? How did his son, granddad Rob, come to the wide field of Midwest promise? Men can be so poor at remembering, so good at clamping down the shame of harder times, letting the string break, the pearls tumble hopelessly out of context and order. How do I know any of this? An in-law, cousin Bob's wife, researched, sent her family history after dad was gone. Then unearthed in mother's basement, a handful of pictures from a childhood he'd never shown. Dad at age two on a dark doorstep in a white smudged dressing gown, looking slightly stunned. Whose eye is behind that camera? His own dad, proud of his firstborn, 1920 or 21, just before the 20s began to roar. Next time we see him, he's six or so, leaning his head against his mother's right side, his little sister Peggy leaning on her left. Grandmother Muriel stands upright in proper lady's dress and hat, the Sunday before church, perhaps. He was the candy kid, goody two-shoes, my mother always said. <laughs> Obedient, helpful Catholic schoolboy doing his mama's bidding when asked. Altar boy, no doubt a prerequisite for his entry into the seminary, which, yes, he left before becoming a priest, before becoming our father, who wasn't in heaven, though according to his beliefs and by all Catholic measures, he is now. No, he was our father who walked downstairs in front of the TV with a beer. <laughs> or our father who gave each of us our first bath. Or our father who art behind the camera clicking away. Or our father who art at work taking care of other people's children who need it more. Or our father who singeth tenor in church choir. 
Or our father who does smell so foul after eating progresso canned minestrone soup that we refuse to kiss him goodnight. <laughs> or our father who art out in the station wagon smoking his pipe and listening to the ball game because our mother who art a fuss budget won't allow that stench in the house. <laughs> or our father who maketh grown worthy puns. Or our father who doth watch Gilligan's Island and Gomer pile with us downstairs in the family room while our mother art upstairs watching the slightly more highbrow Perry Mason or Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> or our father who art no longer in the body, in the box, in the ground, in the old church cemetery. Or our father who art in heaven, if anyone ever was. <laughs> We have so many um, incidents that keep coming from men who have been sent away to war and then come back and bring the war with them, so I just want to read a poem to remind us about that called Vet. War within him, razors and bayonets, grenade blasts and white phosphorus threatening to dance down neurons to his hands and tear an inadvertent life apart a passerby, his wife. Affectionate wrestling out of the question with those specters popping up like rifle range dummies. Thought the woman could cleanse him while he loved her, loathed her, loved her. Out of his ears or crown, the ghosts of those dead by his hands would vacate, remove their mutilated bodies from inside his eyelids where they've taken up residence since 1953. A class war, gender war, world war, UN sanctioned police action raged on in his bloody arteries long after the accords were signed. The bodies were buried. The duped soldiers were back in clean sheets, trying not to commit a homeland holocaust. called Reading Cold Mountain. Uh, Cold Mountain is the translation of Han Shan, who was a legendary 7th century Chinese sage and recluse who took his name from Cold Mountain, the refuge he called home, where he purportedly left his poems scrawled on the rocks. Reading Cold Mountain. Drums grumble nonstop in the capital city. Deaf men march. Where shall I lend my small but mighty might? To what deity or boneyard shall I make my deepest bow, hungering for, for empty belly, empty of hunger? A single bell rings. Shall I keep still, retreat to the mountains, grab my pen, ink overflowing, or let life's canvas go on scrolling its vast emptiness? The cries of the world lament louder than ever. Sorrow and tenderness burst beyond any known self. Odysseys and homecomings may both lead heavenward or astray. Was there ever an elsewhere to escape to? If so, what a tiny portal it must be by now. If the sage was planning to return, now would be a good time. Yes, <laughs> now. just when we need you most. Forgetting your phase, we set out in the night alone. No one asks where the 13th month went. No one turns her face to the sky. Now when old ones die, the hole closes over behind them. Who remembers the songs to carry them to your dark side? The songs to call them back into our dreams? We wander off, hapless, in corridors of moonbeams, try to shake the sacred sounds from trees, tampering, wakeful. Who remembers how to sleep? We are lost. Come find us. Teach us how to hear the roots drinking water. Oh. Cure. If we can meet and find our own dark treasure, 
heal our own dark scars, our hearts will be mending cracks in the world. This is my old friend, the dark. There's another poet mentioned in this, um, and his picture is up there on the other side, Leonard Irving. I oh, don't oh, mention him by name. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, you'll, you'll hear where he shows up in the poem. My old friend, the dark. How I love the insides of my eyelids, the shades that shield away the frenzied world. Soon the show begins. Never have I dozed to find the dream screen broken or empty, the screenwriters on strike. Each night my old friend, the dark, dims the house lights with reverent hush, then voila, I shrink to ant size, explore the craggy chambers of a small lava block that lives on my bedside table. Renowned teachers on Gaga over suddenly seek my counsel. An old boss drives up 40 years later, no longer a tyrant, but taking me for a joyride in his slick classic Lincoln. Chased by bandits, I dive whole-bodied into a tiny sidewalk puddle and get away clean. An old poet friend makes the long, long trek from the other side just to advise Read Dylan Thomas. <laughs> I fly, not your jetliner kind of whoosh and zoom, but breaststroking with easy glide just above the tree line, something I always knew deep down I could do. Yes, there's plenty of murder and everyone having the sex with the wrong person, but with no price to pay. My long dead father listens on the other end of the phone. How could I ever fear the dark when it doorways me to the underworld and back without yet having to die? No Eurydice needing any Orpheus to lead her back today. This inner sight, a gift at birth, not strived for or earned. This nightly broadcast for one. No signal, no device, no fee, just dream. <laughs> into the home stretch here. This is your poem. This is a poem you are writing for yourself, maybe allowing lids to cast downward an inward gaze, feeling the beingness of this given body, inhabiting belly, avowing heart, allowing upwelling throat. Invite all that is yearning to be sung or chanted, sworn to or ranted, a simple sound universal, a holy tantrum or primal blessing, longing by this very next breath to be made. Listen for it, you know it by heart. Perhaps in sudden memory, you clutch tight the rails of a twirling carousel cradled in the whole world and spin and ache and wee of the round, round world, or bumping hard now into edges of thick-throated unspeakables stuck in there so long you made a you of it. Tell this, tell this, no matter its dark, inky threat. Allow the sound. Let loose in real time unforeseen arias, ancestral rumblings, age-old sighs, or with trusty pen, with mighty howl, stab through the heart of whatever vampire needs staking. Then back from ancient history, celebrate this shaft of light bathing the floor, this hungry cat meow, this urgent rustle of palm leaves, this silent, unending sweep of clock hand. Where is this headed? You choose particulars. Your free will finally riding the wave that used to flood you. Reach the shore, land soggy and astonished like your first earthly entrance. Here may you sing your sojourn's fullest anthem, the song that always leads home. So I'll send
end us off here with a, uh, a little parody of the song. I, I wrote the parody of the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and it just says, Have Yourself an Existential Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know, like everybody else, my voice hasn't been quite right since the days of, you know, you know what I mean. Yes. <laughs> Have you, I can take it lower. Have yourself an existential Christmas. Wonder why you're here. Doubt the authenticity of all this cheer. <laughs> why sing Bible quotes and Christmas carols? Try Sartre and Kierkegaard. God is dead, we'll fill all our greeting cards. So have yourself an existential Christmas now. Here we are, morning, noon, and night, gorging like it's our last meal. Sugar highs and credit buys make it seem like life's not real. <laughs> In this time of frantic stimulation, please don't be annoyed. While I have a confrontation with the void, <laughs> let's each have our own existential Christmas now. Let's each have our own existential Christmas now. <laughs> She'll, she'll have them at the break. We have a, a wonderful second half. Give her another round of applause, please. That was great. The song was great. I love that.